Okay, that'll be great if you can. Okay, so anyway, welcome everybody. Uh, good to see you. And uh, my name is Don, Don Brutzman, and we're here to uh, talk about Hanny. And I don't know if uh, she's even gotten started watching the videos yet, but I got to say it's pretty exciting. And uh, as somebody noted, uh, uh, gee, this is uh, 2020, just like Hanning's been talking about, 2020 foresight. So, so that'll be cool. You're welcome to uh, be on video or not, as you wish, uh, when, when we're uh, – chatting uh it's it's good to share so people can uh, uh see your expression and stuff like that but uh there's so much to talk about that uh i'm uh i'm pretty pumped up so i think for our first day what we do is just get you all familiarized i'll show you a bunch of stuff so you know what the assets are but then uh we'll go around the room as it were, everybody gets to talk and uh, um, give their reactions. If you have some that you want to share and describe and uh, we'll keep, uh, keep going. So there's no uh, exact right answer or wrong answer here. There's just a lot of uh, cool things to think about. So let's start with uh, just the basic mechanics and I'm going to start sharing a screen here. And uh, uh, this will be interesting to see if the screen is on the uh, recording or not. Uh, we are recording in case anybody has any uh, issues with that. Uh, you don't have to reveal your uh, identity or anything. I did notice uh, uh, for some of the people who didn't turn on their camera, it's just showing uh, cell phone and stuff like that. So any any photos we create or other things we create, we'll try to uh, depersonalize before we put them on. Um, bringing it up just so you know in advance and you can alert me if you have uh, any issues or uh, hesitation. So question is, uh, is my page coming across on the share screen? Mm -hmm. We can see it. Okay, great, thanks. Marty says so, yes. Um, uh, most of you uh, have direct access to this. Uh, I'm going to uh, put our clean URL on the screen and add it to the chat uh, because uh, uh, this is the Sakai learning site, internal 10 PS for those of you are outside. And, uh, one of the hallmarks of this class has been that we uh, do technical stuff as part of this dissemination with the video. And uh, that's been actually the reason why we're here today, I think. Now, please pause for one second. I think uh, with the two screens, if I need to look at you guys, I got to go to a second screen. So I'm going to experiment a little bit here on my end and try to do single screen for everything and see if that um, is possible. So uh, you for can, me to do that. You can put all the uh, participant videos off to the side. And you can Thank select you, grid video. Yep. And so uh, I will do that. And hopefully for you guys, uh, it's not a problem, but I'm going to count on you all to say something if uh, parts of the screen are obscured. Please interrupt. So question. Right now I've got your grid. I've got the video grid superimposed on the uh, display. So do, are you seeing a gray spot there or what? Do I have to deconflict that? Zoom's got it just fine. Hello. Zoom's got it okay, fine. Okay, good. Beautiful. Um, okay, so here's the page. And uh, you all can read very well, I'm sure, and that's why you're in this course. And so there's our summary of what it's about. It's, uh, it's really interesting 
trying to summarize Hamming because he is all over the place. There's so much stuff going on here. And uh, so uh, I hope that you take this as, wow, we get to observe a master up close, a brilliant, brilliant individual and uh, who's nevertheless not in outer space, not on some pedestal, but very practical, very much caring about you and your work. And here he is speaking to us in 2020. Okay, so uh, let's work around uh, the site. The very first thing as a student you want to do is go to the syllabus. And uh, there is the way to uh oh my browser's playing with me here uh here it is. coming up so you can do it on your own as well uh here we go How's that coming across? Not yet. Yep. Nope. Are you seeing it? Yep. Syllabus up. Okay, great. So, uh, 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 in the chat window, I am now going to give you my, uh, Last four of my cell. And you're welcome to call me, text me, whatever, if uh, you're having trouble at any point and I'm not seeing your mail. The way to make, get me to see your mail is to put Hamming or MB4000 in the subject line and then my filter will work. So uh, nothing personal if I'm not seeing it, uh, just that's, the way it goes, there's a time-honored uh, computer science term for this. It's called interrupt-driven, and that's my schedule. Uh, okay, so uh, that's how you reach me. The routine you want to set up yourself is uh, watch three videos a week, and we'll have uh, some other assets too, and we're going to have projects. And uh, we'll, your individual assignments are going to vary. We'll, we'll get into that more, uh, but uh, if this course is not helping your research or not helping your thesis or not helping you, then you're not taking it right. <laughs> and, and we'll have plenty of examples for how can you get the most out of this course. All right, so uh, thanks to uh, uh, Irene, we have uh, Irene Berry at the uh, library, our uh, digital assets uh, uh, expert. Uh, we have two sets of videos for you. One is inside in Calhoun on the uh, library's archive, and the second is outside on YouTube. And uh, I was playing the YouTube stuff last night on my uh, second screen, and it's, uh, it's very nice how it rolls from one talk to the other. Uh, I found the... Um, uh, resolution was pretty acceptable, uh, which was amazing since we started with VHS tapes back in 95. Okay, the book is available online uh, in two ways. You can buy it uh, if you uh, find the right bookseller, but you can also read all the chapters. We'll look at those chapters, but uh, uh, Dr. Hamming explicitly gave permission he gave me a copy of the course notes. He said, yes, you are allowed to scan these and put them online in support of the course for anybody who wants to, uh, wants to read as well as watch it. So uh, I, I expect this book will go in and out of uh, publication over the years. Probably has uh, at least once or twice already. Um, the PDFs of the chapters are uh, 
almost exactly verbatim, probably 99.9% uh, the same as the published book. Uh, you'll see in the videos that Hanning himself was quite uh, sensitive to honoring uh, the contract with the bookseller. He couldn't give the book away, but he could give his notes away. Uh, he had copyright on that. And uh, since they matched, the only improvement in the book is that they uh, have the, the right line art uh, or they have professionally done line art. So here's what the cover of the book looks like. And uh, so by line art, I mean stuff like this. Let's see if I can get this picture to come. Uh, for example, you'll find a hand-drawn version of that type of figure in the in the course notes. Okay, so that's the basic difference. Uh, you will also often see copies of uh, those one way or the other in the slide set when it makes sense to illuminate the material. Okay. Uh, uh, meeting time. Uh, the long form of this is uh, Hamming, early in his career, said that uh, if you're not spending 10% of your time thinking about the future, you're probably not thinking about the future. And so he personally dedicated Friday afternoons to thinking about the future, talking to others, learning, uh, doing a reset on whatever subject he was working on and going forward on to uh, uh, topic du jour, topic of interest that mattered to him. And so uh, we're honoring that by meeting every Friday afternoon. And I, I slid it back a little bit to noon so that folks on the East Coast uh, uh, could attend without problems and uh, conceivably maybe even uh, folks in Europe too at some point someday. So uh, next, number three, we're in considering important questions. The answers are not always the same, meaning for you and you and you and you and, and uh, each of us. Uh, and also over time, the, what seem, might seem to be the right answer today is not the right answer necessarily tomorrow or in the future. Really interesting. And uh, it's really interesting with the benefit of uh, 2020 hindsight, watching his talks today and seeing how it compared to what was our understanding 10 years ago, what was our understanding uh, uh, in 95 when he talked about it, what was his understanding prior to that as he built all these thoughts not necessarily the same. And that's, that's one of the strongest themes in this course, I think, is how the evolution of our knowledge and the variations can continue. Okay, so uh, uh, hang on, it's a wild ride. Uh, if you meet anybody who knows all the subjects in this book, then I wanna shake their hand uh, and uh, That's okay, because he covers the breadth of it to illustrate how did people in his day and age grapple with this kind of thing? How did they deal with it? How are these patterns repeating as you go from domain to domain to domain to domain? How does the general aspects of knowledge play out in what we consider to be specialties, even when they're closely intertwined without people often knowing it. So this is really interesting. And he, he points out that whether you track all the details or not, he's intentionally presented in a way that you don't have to be the expert in uh, quantum physics or information theory or whatever to say, oh, oh, I see what he's talking about there. So rephrase. If you're put off by, oh my God, what a topic. How could I ever listen to a lecture on that? That's not my business. Hold that thought and just go in for the ride. And uh, uh, I found that not only is it interesting, not only is Hamming correct in that the patterns keep manifesting themselves, 
but you learn more each time. You don't you don't suddenly wake up and know everything about a, a subject that's quite iterative. Okay, uh, let's see what's left on this thing. Course objectives. Uh, you might want to write your own version of this paragraph at the end of the course. That's interesting. It's a uh, tricky business. And then you have some of my my guidance here on the end on how to study and succeed and do well. Um, let's talk about grading. Uh, we've had a little go round already on, oh, is it pass fail? Is it graded or whatever? I, uh, as you see on number five here, uh, uh, if you, if you're not doing a work in a course like this, then why are you here? <laughs> uh, uh, you're not done yet. So whether it's pass fail or a incomplete, I, I consider it the same. It'll be caught the same. You'll all be evaluated the same. You'll all probably implicitly evaluate each other the same. So, uh, don't worry about the grade business. We'll sort that out. Um, Okay, not on here. Make sure everybody should be on Sakai. We'll see that. But if you want to get credit within NTS, I need you in uh, uh, Python. And if I haven't seen your thing yet and clicked on it, I will. And if uh, it's not working for you, then we'll get the right person to make it work for you. Okay, so there's a syllabus. How are we doing so far? Questions? Pretty straightforward, huh? All right, so uh, uh, let's continue the tour. Just so you're familiar. Okay, if you go to, uh, I put some of the quick links right up front. And for people outside, <clears throat> including uh, anybody you know or want to invite who you think is uh, interested, then uh, um, they're welcome to take it, and uh, uh, we'll give them. Uh, I'll be happy to write them a letter after the fact if there's no possible way for NPS to give them credit externally. Our school is slowly, gently, but inevitably evolving into the future, and uh, I think this course is an important part of what NPS has to offer. So it's presented in that light, and we'll give people credit when they, whenever they uh, earn it. So, um, on the announcements page, our, our site uh, changes. This is kind of our work list, and uh, so you can uh, you can look at this as sort of a status page of what's going on. Uh, I won't edit it as we go here because I'll just bumble and bumble it, but uh, uh, please write down stuff if you think we need to do it or if it's a question or whatever. Let's keep track of it because, once again, everything we've done in this course has been iterative ever since the first day. So you can see uh, some ideas for projects and other things already. And... Uh, uh, making it sensible for the web is very important. So here's where I hope to be at the end of the course. I hope that we have regularized it sufficiently that people just taking it for directed study is easy. If we have recorded each of these weekly sessions, that's not the same as being here. And you may not get as much of the microphone this week as other weeks, but uh, uh, I would like to make this course just available year round. And so your insights as students are central to that. How do we do that well? And uh, who knows, maybe uh, someday if it keeps growing and growing, we'll even get to newer and higher and better levels. So stand by. There have already been a couple of theses written on this topic, uh, on this whole course. Uh, Tracy Emsweiler and a couple other students, and there may be more because we keep learning things as we go through. How do we share and present this material? Okay. Uh, uh, let's keep charging around the uh, assets here. Okay, so uh, hopefully everybody's on the calendar. Uh, I also put it in here for people to click on, and I did get a positive from 
uh, Michelle Eisenhower that uh, she couldn't be here today due to a schedule conflict, but she's already reported completion on one of the action items there, which was, uh, did that calendar item work for somebody else? Yes, she's confirmed that. So we're good there. Um, I missed our other announcements. Let's go to that. Here's the uh, course summary. This is intended to be shareable with others. If you want to share that, you can also forward the uh, calendar event. And then the next announcement was, uh, oh, just uh, when we finally got it re-encoded up on YouTube. So if I count correctly, I think we're looking at the fourth generation of the videos, the digitization of the videos on YouTube and on Calhoun right now. And so that's about as good as we think it'll probably get compared to the uh, VHS tapes that we originally recorded. Uh, got a box of those uh, stashed over in the library as part of the Hanning Archive now. But uh, that's a topic for future discussion too. Can you get beyond what's there? And actually uh, with encoding coding techniques, you might be able to. Okay, uh, still clicking on the site. Uh, there it is. There's the primary asset, I think, for, for this thing. And if you go to uh, playlists on the uh, YouTube site, you can see, uh, uh, well, let me jump it around a little bit here. Oh, come on. Um, it's sort of like this thing resorts. It's never the same twice, but if you want them in the proper order, and I'm going to try to lock that down, uh, um, there it is. The 32 videos, that's the heart of the course, watching all those. We also have some more stuff on uh, background and uh, related work. And we've uh, also uh, uh, started adding uh, work from uh, Marty Mandelberg. Uh, Dr. Mandelberg, would you mind waving hi to everybody? He's uh, writing a biography. Uh, we're going to give him a future session in this course to tell us about what he's done. And you're going to see some more videos uh, appear in there from his talks at NPS. Okay. So uh, uh, not well exposed right now, but will be is basically we had to do a lot of the stuff that YouTube gives you for free now. We were working that uh, by hand by writing our own tools that auto-generated web pages to expose these videos. If you wanted a quick look at that, you could go to my homepage and you'll see some links for hamming there under courses and uh so there we go hamming hamming this has not been updated yet this is the uh old stuff but all of these pages here with the uh older encodings of videos and older encodings of slides and the auto generation of uh slides well they don't always work right now but this, they were uh auto generated and so I'm very happy to report that we don't have to do that anymore. And because uh, uh, maintenance is hard. More on that at a future session. Okay, let's see where are we at now. Uh, here we go. Okay. I haven't used the messages yet for this class, but I will if there's anything time sensitive. So I'll be scrupulous about keeping this site up to date for y'all. Uh, resources, this is actually important. This is where you find the chapters of the book. So if you click on that, you can find the PDFs of each one. And uh, let's look at one. Here it comes. Okay, there it is, a PDF, a scan of uh, the draft book chapter that went to the publisher. And 
including uh, hamming scribbles and all, as he did the final proofreading uh, for classes and then for the publisher. Okay, so yes, indeed, those were the documents that uh, Hamming himself approved in all this business. Also in this section of the archive under resources, the resources tab here is uh, you'll find the slide sets. And the slide sets are pretty interesting because uh, we didn't have slide sets back in the day. At most we had uh, transparencies uh, show of hands, how many people remember transparencies? Yeah, I know, you got to be very old to remember that. Uh, um, uh, Hanning just spoke contemporaneously. You could see that in the videos. But he would keep going back and forth to the podium and look down at his notes. Those notes were the very chapters that you have in your hands in, in this archive. So he would speak to that, not read that, but speak to that. So over time, we created versions of these that summarized this. And these were uh, class projects, basically, student projects individually. Everybody would pick one of the chapters and do it. And they're in a pretty, uh, pretty high state of sheen right now, but uh, there's no reason we can't do better. So uh, first request to all of you is when you see something that needs fix, fixing, write it down. Make sure you get it. Second, uh, um, if we want to divide and conquer the slide sets, if you want to own a slide set and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. This chapter of his book, this is really important to me, and I liked the slide set before, but it would be better. Okay, that's all right. Each of these slide sets is about, uh, well, third or fourth generation already. So if you want to take charge of it, fine. Uh, third point. I'm probably going to put them all into uh, version control to facilitate our ability to do updates on it. So you can expect to see that. Uh, next week or the week after. I'll probably have these things in um, uh, GitLab and PSEDU. And it doesn't really uh, support PowerPoint. It's, it's not a SharePoint, but it is a good way to share documents and collaboratively work together. So uh, then we, we just get down to the human handshaking of who owns it or what. Okay, so looking at going back up to the resources, that's about it. Oh, and there's the syllabus again. Okay, roster, if you've made it into the class but you're not finding yourself on the roster, then please holler at me. Uh, I've noticed that the uh, roster of people signing up or me adding them is actually got some duplication, so that's a, a to-do uh, item for the Sakai folks, why are people listed twice? So don't worry if it's twice, I'll fix that. And then finally, uh, a few utility links. I'll show you what's here. I assume that none of you have site info, but uh, Sakai is a little bit long in the tooth, but it's come a long way and they keep improving it. So uh, just about everything here in the site it might not be the utterly snazziest uh, portal tool there is, but it's pretty good. And uh, another thing that's very good about it is uh, the NPS staff uh, at Center for uh, or Distance Learning Center uh, uh, is tremendous. So if there's an issue, they fix it pretty quickly. They're they're uh, right on top of it. Further. Uh, at least nowadays, you guys are taking a heck of a lot more courses than I am. So if you see better ways or additional ways you want to have us integrate Sakai capabilities into the class, fine. I have resisted the urge to add chat to this because I don't want to lose anything. And uh, chat logs sometimes disappear. So. Um, 
more to follow on that, but that's that's where the, the thinking is. Okay, and finally, I've added the library and the Graduate Writing Center for uh, uh, a couple of reasons. One is uh, uh, Graduate Writing Center. That's crucial to how can you improve your thesis and where can this go? And so as you're looking at Hamming's ideas and going, how does that go in my thesis? The Graduate Writing Center may be, uh, uh, well, it inevitably will be a very good resource for you. Um, uh, similarly, the library has undertaken a major activity. They've been doing it for a few years, and uh, we've got a, a boost from uh, Dr. Mandelberg and a gift to the foundation. Um, um, they're doing a whole Hamming uh, archive there, and Irene will uh, tell us more about that in a, in a future course, future session. Okay, so let me see if I can get us back to where we were here. All right, questions about the Sakai site. Irene, if you wanted to give a shout out now about the library and your efforts, you're welcome to, but uh, otherwise we'll just press right now. Sure, I'd be glad to just really briefly because I bet people would like to press right on. But um, uh, Don was talking about the archive, and in fact, yes, we do have in special collections and archives a uh, fine collection there that includes those videos that he mentioned and lots of, of manuscript materials and other sort of real items. Uh, from him, from his life and from his office, contributions um, are growing. I think Dr. Mandelberg will have something to say about that in the future. We are working now to bring the materials or the um, some of those physical materials to still yet to be uh, worked on, photographed, and accounted for. But I feel like in a privileged position in some ways because I've had my eyes and my hands on those materials for a long time and being able to read them in advance of this course makes me realize that something Don said is, is really true, that the materials are extremely accessible no matter what your background is because I wouldn't ordinarily think that I'd be a good candidate without Dr. Hamming and, and, and his so that's probably all I have to say. Unless anybody has any questions, I'm reachable. I'm in Outlook and happy to help on the library's end and, and the archive. Okay. Thank you, Irene. Questions? Okay, so let's see, we're 40 minutes in. Let's, uh, let's look at some slides. And uh, I tend to go long on the, uh, first chapter or two on slides just because it is so powerful and fundamental that I don't want anybody to get overwhelmed. Because <laughs> uh, uh, if, if uh, everybody's uh, five, six feet tall, Hamming's somewhere around 11 or 11 feet tall. And uh, uh, don't, please don't feel overwhelmed. It's it's all about going forward and iterating and learning more. So um, question for you all, uh, and uh, let's take, take our time answering uh, verbally. Did people get a chance to see the uh, SGL version? I, I started to watch it about 15 minutes. Thank you, Toby. I was able to get through three of the four videos this week. Pretty interesting, especially that opening to the SGL and then his classwork. Thank you. Was that uh, Matthew? Oh, uh, that was John. I'm sorry, John. Thank you, John. I'm uh, I'm learning too. Uh, I I, uh, I assume this grid is not coming across right now. Are you guys seeing the grid? 
I think Zoom just leaves your video on the machine so it doesn't move. At the moment, so nobody's seeing anybody else's video except your own, right? Uh, there's a there's a display on uh, on your video thing that if you go into the grid icon that shows them all, then suddenly I can see who's talking instead of jumping up and down the list. Okay, so other other comments people might have. Thank you, John. Thank you, Toby, for for your comments. Uh, this is Matt. I only watched the uh, first three videos to see the uh, the superintendent's lecture. Cheers. Uh, uh, boy, I've watched it so many times. I I actually am not a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty darn sure I was there and got to watch him. And it wasn't until years later because I heard a rumor that they recorded it that I walked back to the library and. Uh, I mean, this was a classic library moment. They went, oh, yeah, I guess we did. And somebody went searching in the back. No, I can't find it. Came back a week later, they went searching. Oh, here it is. And they gave me the video, and we were able to digitize it and record it. So this archival stuff is hard, and it, it's worth the effort. That's why we'll continue to pause when we, we get to those points. As I watch the replay, it's it's uh, it's interesting because this was this was back in the day, right? It was it was uh, quite a number of years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, what was the date again? Uh, Thirty April, nineteen ninety, was his lecture, and they called it Superintendent's Lecture. Uh, still SGL. That was the name of it, but the, the, now called the president of NPS, got to invite uh, who the speaker was. They invited uh, uh, Richard Hamming, who was well known around campus as a character, as somebody who is opinionated, to speak. And I think he blew a lot of people away uh, when he gave it. So I, I kind of view this first lecture as the greatest hits. Uh, of Richard Hamming tape. Uh, it's, it's kind of a snapshot of many of the subjects he covers as you go through the rest of the uh, course video. So uh, uh, here's some subtleties to observe when you watch that video and uh, maybe look at it again someday. He, uh, he's pretty dry, right? He's not a He's not a real uh, hand wavy, jolly uh, 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 television host or anything like that. He's just putting out a lot of information in a straightforward way with occasional, I wouldn't say provocative, maybe more thought provoking zingers. So far, so good. Everybody tracking me on that? Okay. So then what's interesting, even though it's really faint on the video, is he's getting laughs. He's getting real laughs, even with a dry uh, sense of humor. And uh, the uh, King Hall was pretty much full for that talk. Uh, uh, so that's, I don't know, 1,600, 1,800 people maybe uh, uh, who were sitting there. And he's saying some fairly subtle things, and you can hear the whole audience gets it and is and is laughing. So that if you pay close attention, that can really uh, help add a little bit to the uh, uh, the distance of the distance learning here. We're at a distance of uh, well, thirty years from when he gave that talk, right there in King Hall, where you've been and where you're going again. So uh, interesting, interesting. So uh, uh, let's look at a little more on some of these slides. The, uh, uh, see if this works. Does the full screen mode, what does that show you? Probably, uh, probably uh, doesn't show you full screen. I think that's because I have a second window open. Let's see if that changes it. 
Oh, and by the way, welcome to the Hamming class where we, we uh, boomerang bungee jump from the sublime to the ridiculous of uh, somebody talking about the great truths and things we don't understand to, hey, how come my screen is broken? <laughs> uh, how is it now? No change. Can't hear you, Tobe. Um, it it changed. Like, it Works. looks like we're even though it's in the middle of the presentation. That's better. It's showing gray. Okay. Gray there. Okay, so is it, uh, very good. Thank you. So, uh, uh, this is a deja vu moment in that each time we've given this course over the years and the different generations of technology, there's been different goofiness and different goodness that comes out of this. And part of what we do in this class is evaluate the effectiveness of dissemination this way, sharing it. That, isn't the, that is not the essence of it. This is not a let's critique video. But this started when video was still, oh, I don't know, video and computers, are we allowed to use those two words in the same sentence? It was not, uh, certainly not well practiced then. And as we've gone through successive iterations of dissemination, encoding, making sense of it, each class has added value. So you guys get a chance to do that too. So we will pause for these experimental aspects of it. Okay, so the slide set itself is kind of an overview. Uh, he passed in his sleep right at the beginning of the year. We, we were just, I think uh, class had just started a few days before that. Uh, so it was suddenly like uh, one of the fixtures of NPS was suddenly no longer there. Uh, Carpe Diem sees a day. I think just about everybody's uh, sensitized to that uh, with, with, uh, coronavirus and everything else. So it's interesting that our current necessary focus on distance learning is bringing several of these things back to bear right again. So I'm, I'm, I'm certain that we're going to learn more things out of this. Um, we list his degrees because uh, it tells you a story right there. Mathematics, mathematics, mathematics. He was a mathematician. And you'll notice over time as you pay attention and how he phrases things, he's very precise and very mathematical in how he says it. Uh, uh, in the videos, he, uh, he's told this story. Uh, confession, I, I, I sat through his class. When we recorded the video, that was the third time I sat through his class. So I've heard his story several times. They vary a little. They weren't always the same in each course, but he often hit the main thing. So I remember I took his course, some of his st stories he told when he was teaching us probability and statistics the first time around. And uh, he had a very funny story about, well, gee, Dr. Hamming, how did you get called up to go to Los Alamos to work on the Manhattan Project? Did you know what was? Did you know what was going on? And that wasn't me asking it. That was one of our, our, our classmates. And was like, well, actually, no, I had no idea what was going on. Uh, but I got invited and it kept going. And um, Marty, I'm sure you'll have more detail on this in the future. But how he how he portrayed it to us was. So I got this telegram and I went and I went to the street corner and then. Uh, I got on a bus and I went across town and I got on a train and I rode for three days and I got off and I walked down to the other corner where they told me and then a car came and picked me up and we drove off into the desert and then I was working at Los Alamos <laughs> was how he answered it. So, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, welcome to wartime was kind of our takeaway. Uh, uh, it was really interesting. So uh, that is one of the sub-themes 
of text in this course is all the things that went on there and how it influenced his thinking, how it influenced uh, where he went, what he did, how he worked on problems. So definitely pay attention whenever he's talking about that. The list goes on and on of all the things that he did. Uh, Irene, I don't envy you the challenge right now. You can, you can all see it when you go to the Hamming collection. It's an immense amount of material. It's an immense, he's, he's getting awards for awards. Uh, uh, ACM, he was the first president of the ACM back when it wasn't one of the primary professional societies of computer science with uh, uh, many, many thousands of members. Uh, it was just like, well, it's a good idea. We ought to talk to each other. We're, we're, we're scientists, right? Uh, back in the day when the joke was, uh, well, uh, uh, computer science is the only science that's not a science because it's only about computers. Uh, uh, so there's a reason for that. He, he didn't, wasn't getting these awards just to be popular, but because he was a seminal thinker and an influencer and was very interested in how people thought and worked together, et cetera, et cetera. Many famous quotes. I've uh, started yet another list of quotes and uh, that's on Irene's and my action list downstream is how do we keep building on these quotes? They're flagged here not to go, oh, good quote, good quote. You, you're going to get a lot of that. But to flag them to your attention, it, really pay attention when he starts talking about these things to hear, how did he say that? What did he tell us? What's that mean? Better to do the right problem the wrong way than the wrong problem the right way? He he did have some of that in his in his first the first two talks. Does anybody want to tell us their take on uh, that one? Better to do the right problem the wrong way. Um. Do you want my input or are you looking for the students? I think he's looking for Go anybody. Ahead, okay, yeah, this is uh, Marty Mandelberg, the biographer of Richard Hamming. And uh, Don, I'll be sending you out copies of this. This is the Blad, the preview version of the biography, which hopefully will be out next month. Don, I'll talk to you about uh, sending these books at cost, and uh, if people want them, or I may just make them for free. Uh, uh, per your question, once you did your great thoughts and came up with an important problem, Hamming wanted you to work on the problem, even if you worked on it the wrong way. If you're working on an insignificant problem and you're doing the right way, what does it really matter? to him. He wanted you to refocus on the important problem. Thank you, Marty. Anybody else? So one, one topic that he constantly talks about is the relationship between humans and the increasing computing power that he foresaw coming. Uh, and I think you could argue based off of the last couple decades of cognitive systems engineering uh, and, and viewing humans and computers as an integrated team rather than opposed to one another that you might say that he had the, the wrong perspective uh, that is used all over the place of human capability versus computer capability. But the important thing for that time is that he was acknowledging that this was a big issue that needed to be addressed rather than whether he had a perspective that these days we'd say is is the right one. Anyone else? Well, I will talk about that one, but I like his first quote on that slide. The purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. And I think that gets lost. That's lost today uh, across just about every field that uses a computer. 
we tend to see people. Glenn, you mind uh, putting on your, uh, can you put on the camera, please? Yeah, I turn my camera. If you don't mind. Yeah, so, so, the, so the, the difference is, you know, it's, instead of looking at the computer as a tool to provide you with insights that on the models and algorithms that it's running and recognizing that they're not absolutely perfect, that they're abstractions, and then learning something and then applying that learning, we tend to have people who look at computers in terms of they're going to give me the right answer in their output. And I think that's that, that we've lost sight of that whole idea that the computer and computing technologies are a tool to be used to gain insights into problem spaces that we cannot uh, you know, uh, calculate in our own minds that we need, uh, we need help with, uh, but that it's not the answer. <clears throat> Thank you. Others? I think you can go in with that. It's, he makes the comment in his intro document of the science in science, if you know what you are doing, you should not be doing it. That to the last point that computers are supposedly going to give us the right answer, but they often don't because it's all based on our input and how, how we program it. It's just going to give us light uh, insight to it. But if you know what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it because it's something trivial and something easy. So we need to be tackling those hard problems and focusing on on, on the right problem, even if we're doing it the wrong way. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, uh, as with many, many things that Hamming says, they're double-edged swords. And uh, flipping it around each time, either to the converse or better yet, to the first person singular can be really intense. So uh, uh, let's try first person singular ever so briefly here. Uh, the first one, well, Glenn just uh, gave us a little longer form. Uh, purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. This was back in the day when a good way to win any argument was to take a big sheaf of printouts, uh, you know, they were usually about uh, 18 inches wide and 16 inches, to, uh, and drop that pile of paper on it. See, see, numbers don't lie. I told you I win this argument. <laughs> no, really, that, there was a lot of that going on. Uh, and, he, and that was Hamming pushing back on that. No, just because you made a bunch of numbers doesn't mean you understand it. Okay, that's pretty tangible, but worth repeating. Now let's 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 get a little pricklier on the first person. Gee, is everybody here working on the right problem? Gee, is the way you have posed your thesis question have well, we, we know the goal, but uh, have we pose the right problem. Do we know what the root cause or the, the key point is or something? And, and, and am, am, I, am I going in the right direction or am I just digging a hole and making it deeper? Oh, oh, are, are, are all of those people digging a bigger hole and all making it deeper instead of looking at the right problem? Right. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that I find interesting about that second quote is if you think about research and you think about what we know philosophically about the universe, you recognize that we never are working on the right problem. We're always working on a problem, but we don't necessarily know what the right problem is, which is the whole point of, of science and learning. Because as soon as we start to realize that either we're not working on the right problem or, or what we're doing is wrong, we adjust and we learn from that. So I think to me, what that second quote says, part of it is, you know, it's, it's better to do something to try to solve a problem than it is to do nothing. 
Um, and even if that something that you're doing is not the right something, what you will learn from doing it the wrong way will help you ultimately figure out the right way. My, my two cents. But the problem is uh, who tells you what's wrong and what's right? You just start working on a problem and uh, maybe some days down the road, you realize, oh, damn, it was a wrong problem. Hopefully you learn something like uh, Colonel Hodge just said, and you adjust your problem. But if you don't learn something from it and you keep working on the wrong problem, it's riding like a hobby, hobby horse and you just keep going, getting paid for it. But there is no outcome. Well, but, but is, it the, is it necessary? Maybe it's the wrong problem to you, but it might be the right problem to somebody else and you're actually helping someone else's problem. But if you don't have a stakeholder for a problem, it's riding a hobby horse. I think Hamming's going deeper than that on, on both sides. I think the wrong problems are, are the, tri the trivial small problems that don't, don't take a lot of hard work. I think from, from listening to how he was talking about things in, the, uh, in his presentation, he, he was talking about the, the right problems being hard problems that you had to work hard at and that didn't make you comfortable and that the wrong problems were the easy ones that you were comfortable with. That, at least that's, how, that's what I took away from, from his presentation. I actually agree with you, but you know what's interesting when you think about that, when you think about it that way, I stink at math. So any mathematics problem is a hard problem for me. Whereas for somebody like Tobias, it might be easy. So it doesn't necessarily mean if I'm working on a mathematics problem that I find hard, that's actually easy to someone else, it's not the right problem. I have a thought on yes. it. This is Judy Escabel. I'm dialed in on the phone. Um, thank you, I Judy. Have the, uh, oh, thank you. No, I appreciate it. No, I, I haven't had a chance to review um, the videos, but I will do um, this weekend. Um, but just listening to the um, conversation, what, it, what comes to my mind and, um, is the whole aspect of theory development. And so in philosophy, you have the aspect of scientific reasoning. And so, you know, you mentioned, uh, someone mentioned um, computers. Well, that gives us the deductive um, aspect or perspective of, you know, approaching the problem. Whereas you need the more human side of it, which would be the more inductive reasoning. So, so that's, that's what I think about it. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there anybody not uncomfortable yet? <laughs> yeah, I'll just let that one hang in the air. Okay, let's let's press on. Okay. Yeah, mathematics is the language of clear thinking. This is one of his uh, slam dunk lines, and uh, as the mathematician. And, uh, but he is, is usually play both sides of it. If, if there's some kind of mathematical nuance that determines whether something lives or dies, he, no thanks. He doesn't want to get on board that airplane. Uh, uh, Glenn, what you were talking about uh, with mathemat mathematics often reminded me, uh, uh, You've all seen the cartoon, and maybe we should somebody write this down so we put it on our to do list the the cartoon about uh the two mathematicians at the chalkboard and it's all covered with equations and everything else and and then there's a kind of a white space and something in the corner and uh and they're pointing to it and goes yes right there that's and then a miracle occurs <laughs> to get to the q e d point and that's often the case with uh, 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 math. They start with a clear chalkboard every day or a clear whiteboard or a piece of paper. And you can write down a lot of equations, but there's nobody there to tell you, is that right or wrong? So how do you know the equation's right? And 
contrast that. Uh, I don't know. Do we have any mathematicians here to defend themselves? Uh, uh, I may not be saying it quite right, but but contrast that to computer science or programs. We're often taking equations and we're typing them in, and then we're poking them with inputs and looking at the outputs and saying, do these numbers match our expectations? Are we getting insight? Uh, uh, unlike the mathematicians who may never know whether they're right or not just by inspection, other than, you know, really intense thought, clear thinking, for computer science, well, you only have to get it right once. And then the program works and you get results. So there's a little bit of a yin and yang there in terms of math, simulation, programming, it's definitely the language of clear thinking. It's definitely ways to model reality. Reaction. Anybody? All right. So let's press on. And I won't stop on uh, every one of these, but here he's pointing out in a long long-winded way. Uh, well, getting the equation right is good, but that doesn't have to prevent you from making sense, too. That wouldn't it be good if it did make sense? Then you'll see this a few times in the course. Uh, he was very upset at Claude Shannon. Oh, I think I got the book here in the corner. Let me see. He was very upset at Shannon quote unquote, eventually the uh, father of information theory at Bell Labs because Shannon was very content to just keep writing equations and, and writing writing stuff and doing stuff and it wasn't going anywhere. And Shannon said, You gotta tell you gotta tell people this stuff. And 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 he would uh, point to everybody in the room. So you get it's an important part. Being a scientist, you have to tell people what you're doing. That's your responsibility as a member of society, as a member of the human race, to share your knowledge. So it's very funny when you hear him say it. He says, when he said refused, it wasn't a one-time refusal. It was like he poked him for years and hamming so believe that it's important. He wrote the book for Shannon, and this book has been used by many years by lots of people, and that's a whole field of study. That's a whole domain of study right now. It's had great influence. Okay. Get a point for you. And then uh, theoreticians can, can prove any result. Okay. Grain of salt. Uh, this was very funny when he talked about his dissertation was pretty short because, uh, uh, well, he didn't talk about it. He was asked. We, we actually had a, a Marine captain in our section when we took it. And uh, um, as you've seen from the videos, people dressed up a little more in those days. And we'd have, I think, uniform day once a week or something like that. And, uh, so we had a Marine captain and he was charged as section leader with asking all the the hard questions. So here we are struggling to figure out what's our thesis going to be like. And and I don't forget where the conversation went, but he, oh, well, Dr. Hemming, Dr. Hemming, how long was your dissertation? So he gave us a look. Said, well, 27 pages. And we were like, you know, the thesis proposal, they want something like, you know, and, and he could see the shock because he, he knew, he knew what reaction he was going to get. And then he, he finally said, well, there was a lot less to know back then. <laughs> and we're, <laughs> we're laughing like, ah, oh, <laughs> that's yeah. Okay. There's more to know. But then he went long on one of the talks on exponential knowledge. And that's what we're going to start blasting through next. So it was not that he didn't solve something important in his dissertation or find some new thing. It was that truly there was less of a playing field back. Where to go? 
Okay. And then uh, uh, question for you all. Uh, are we going to take a five-minute break in the middle of these things or not? Because if so, the next slide will be a good break point. What do you think? Okay, we got one vote yes. That's all it takes. All right. So uh, here's a real Hammingism. He doesn't say you won't do important work. He doesn't say you can't do important work. He doesn't say you aren't even able to think of important work. He rather poses it as a likelihood, a probability, if you will. If you don't work on an important problem, it's maybe not likely you'll do important work. So it was really fascinating to hear him pose this to an audience because he this was his most popular talk. He gave this talk to you and your research hundreds of times. I got to watch him a handful of times and it was really fascinating because he would talk about all sorts of stuff just like the SDL, but he would end with these questions and he would have people raise their hands so, so who here wants to do important work? Well, the, the title of the talk was usually you and your research. So anybody who came, yeah, they want to do important work. That's why they came to the talk. And then, uh, then while all the hands are in the air, he would ask, well, who here is working on important problems? And you'd see some of the hands get higher, but most of them go, oh, wiggle and one or two go down and the audience thought they knew what was coming next. You know, work hard, work on important work. Uh, no, no, this was his slam dunk line at the end. Why not? Only you can answer that question. Only you can say, is this important work for me? Maybe for others? Am I digging the hole or working on something worthwhile? That's where he was getting to. Okay, so good break point. Shall we take five? Five enough? Okay, Sounds see you in good. five.
So how you doing, Bert? Doing very well. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for joining the course. Very glad. <laughs> Thank you for offering. You literally of course. Toby, uh, are we working on a unit test later today? Mm, yep, I, I've done some X3D coding yesterday. So I closed my rings and I, I worked with the attribute convex. And it looks like that six out of seven players are displaying it right. There's only, wow. one, there's only one player left that's doing some squiggly diggly dings. <laughs> Which one's that? Mm, let me check the name. It's an H3D viewer. Oh, interesting. That's uh, definitely interesting because we they are live and we can uh, reach back to them. Okay, cool. So if you've got six out of seven, that's definitely better than the international average. So, uh, yeah, cool. I think they're in Norway. H3D. Okay, so uh, uh, here's where we're going next. Uh, as we wait for people to come back, uh, we're going to talk about what do you hope to get out of this course? And what are you thinking about? What are your interests? We're going to lead off with that. So actually, we could, uh, we three could start if you want. Uh, because people are probably working on other problems right now. We have gone five minutes, so what do you say? Um, the, the first priority why I took this class is um, to have a class uh, that is fun working on and not a class that I'm forced to work on. I have to be careful how to, how to um, put the words together because Colonel Hodges is listening. <laughs> but a system engineering class, I think in the last quarter, um, in parallel work to the master thesis would be a pain in the, I don't know what I can say, because we are recording, um, it would be a pain. And hopefully MV4000 is a little bit less work and it's fun working for it. <laughs> Cheers. Well, uh, uh, I'm sure Glenn has a eloquent response to that, but could I, for the record, point out that uh, chapter 28 on page uh, 325, 325 is called systems engineering. So maybe you'll get a few insights on that topic here too. Good. How about you, Bert? What are you thinking? Yeah, actually I have to agree, Tobias, as usual, I have to say. Um, the system engineering uh, course was was getting a pain. Let's say pain, like Tobias said. Um, this course uh, seems to be fun for me. You know, I, I uh, uh, watch some videos and I will uh, give you a brief introduction. We can talk to uh, each other and we can. Uh, I will learn a lot uh, out of this course. Uh, since I had a degree in uh, mechanical engineering and I have a uh, degree in um, computer aided engineering. I took already a couple of these system engineering um, classes or modules, and unfortunately, it's terribly time consuming for what you're getting out, you know. So, and this is not the best way in the last uh, trimester or the last quarter, sorry, um, especially when you're uh, working on your master thesis. So, this would be um, a showstopper. It could be. Either you say, okay, I know I go for a C in this class or the master thesis um, will be priority too. And I don't think this is the right way. And this is the reason why we said, okay, yeah, th uh, th there is a uh, course MV4000 offer it by, uh, offered by you. And it's absolutely a great possibility to switch the course and to do something which seems to be fun. And this is a little bit better, I think. Thank you, Bert. How about you, John? What are you thinking about for this course? What might it offer to you that that is a value to you? Sure. So 
this popped up the other week and it was kind of like the perfect opportune time because I was looking for another class that I needed to take within moves. Um, and Hamming being a mathematician and that was my undergrad degree, um, this just kind of fit in and like the, the different style that this course is and learning about how Hamming's thought process is and the different activities that he was working on it was just really intriguing. So it just offered a completely different focus of effort that I think was going to be fun, like the other guys were saying. And then, uh, you know, kind of helps frame different ways to think and different ideas as I'm developing my or further in my thesis right now in the next couple of months before graduation in September. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thanks. Great. Well, very glad you're on board. And, uh, uh, Thanks also for revealing that uh, uh, you studied the subject of clear thinking. So feel free to uh, 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 push me around when I when I say something really broken and stupid. Say, uh, 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 it, not everything is on the right side of that equal sign. You need to balance your equation a little bit to make sense of that. So feel free to get mathematical on us and. Uh, I'm sure Hamming will be cheering somewhere when you do. So how about you, Lauren? You've made some great contributions to this course in the past, and uh, uh, you're uh, you're definitely working on hard problems. So uh, glad to see you here. What are you thinking? Uh, I think it's just time for a refresher and try to uh, – oh, great, there goes my internet. Okay, that's back. Um, we can hear you. A refresher we hear you. And, and, okay. Refresher and just try and get back into the uh, thought process of studying PhD stuff again, rather than being so much admin Very good. Thanks. Right, and, and Glenn? Oh, oh just sorry. A, a quick segue on that. Um, Don, the slides are coming across, and then there's these huge gray blocks. And every once in a while, I can see your, I'm guessing your mouse going across. I'm wondering if, uh, when Zoom is grabbing the window, if you if you drag, are, are you dragging something across in front of the one that's pushing to Zoom, and then yeah, not, yes, yeah, so so then it's just alert. not rendering what's behind anymore. I'm going to revert back to uh, two screens and try not to uh, have a brain inversion as part of that. Uh, so thank you for the alert for it. All right. And going through the tile list, uh, looks like you're next, uh, Glenn. What, yeah, how so, come you're here? Well, well, I'm here to support you, Don. That's why I'm here. It about uh, me. So, uh, so for, all, for, for, all of, for all of my students, two, three, four of you, uh, you know, I, I took this class in 02 and uh, there was three or four of us sitting in a classroom and this was the first class that I took in graduate school where I didn't have somebody telling me, you're going to take a bunch of tests, you're going to take a bunch of quizzes, you're going to write a bunch of code, you're going to uh, you know, get graded on stuff. It was, no, you're going to come into class and you're going to be challenged with really hard questions and you're going to have to think and you're going to have to answer them. And it's not about the right answer or the wrong answer. It's about how you get to the position that you call an answer and what process you go through to get there and the logic that's involved and all of those kinds of things. Uh, so I, I don't, I'm not a mathematician. I didn't understand and probably and I haven't watched any of the videos again. I still have the printed out book that I printed out and bound in my office with the DVDs or the CDs of all the lectures. It's in my office if anybody wants to borrow it. But I didn't understand half of what Hamming was saying. But it was just being exposed to someone who was much, much smarter in a lot of these areas than I was and still am that help to elevate the way that I think about things and approach problems. So I think this is, th- this is one of those classes that graduate students that I, that I have found, uh, some of them online now, really appreciate the ability to go into a class, not have to worry about the assignments so much, but get to actually do some higher level thinking and get to have that intellectual tug of war 
which I think this class is one of the few classes that we offer that provides that. And, and because there really are no right or wrong answers, it really comes down to what you learn from the dialogue between each other. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in because you added me to the class and, and, um, and, and I probably need this kind of refresher because I'm going to have to do this probably in the summer when I teach my class. Gwen, thank you. Uh, no good deed goes unpunished. So you and Lauren both, uh, uh, be, before we break in June, uh, please write a testimonial for the website about uh, not just how this helped you early in in your graduate studies, but also now later, that now that you're, well, playing in the big leagues, uh, dissertation, postdoctoral work, uh, what, what Hamming means to you, I'm sure others will get value out of here and your, your big thoughts on what you just said. So thanks in advance for that. Um, Matt, how about you? Uh, to be honest, I'm a little unclear about uh, what exactly uh, is going to be happening in this class. Uh, I'm interested in learning, uh, talking about the priority is on supporting our research. Um, considering that's all I'm doing is learning uh, what I think I need to learn. I do like his approach. Uh, of looking at the history and how things evolve, because that's that's how I feel I need to learn about everything, whether that's right now uh, industrial, organizational, cognitive uh, science and psychology, and going and seeing how it progresses. It seems to be similar to um, his storytelling about how everyone learns and builds upon prior research. Uh, and it is very interesting to, to see how it really happens uh, as opposed to just reading in a textbook here's what you should just know um, so i appreciate that aspect of, of how he portrays science and learning um, but I'm a little unclear about what exactly the projects are in this class and how that's going to be able to relate to the learning i'm attempting to do right now very good. No, really. Uh, and thanks for centering us on the right questions. Uh, does this matter? Does this matter to you? And uh, everybody has a different answer to that. Uh, the projects are very subjective and uh, subjective to each individual. And how does it help? So uh, we will iterate over that. Um, you're asking the right question right now. And rather than try to give you the glib uh, short form answer, we've heard bunch of it already. I'm happy to break out with you uh, outside of the regular class time to help you focus your questions right on where they would answer or not. It might not be for everybody, but certainly uh, uh, I'm glad that you're here and thinking about how this could uh, influence or help your, your dissertation research. I think that's a great thing. Thanks. So thank you. Um, uh, placeholder answer. Marty, how about you? you? You've got plenty of things you could be doing. Um, uh, what's your take? Sorry, we're not hearing you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, thanks. thank you. Yeah, having spent the last three years uh, trying to get into the head of Richard Wesley Hemming, my mentor, um, I have lots of different ways of answering that question, um, but I, I'd like to see how I can assist anybody else on this teleconference on, on uh, extracting what part of Hamming resonates with you. Hamming was a polymath. He learned French, he liked ballet, he read about religions and philosophy. He was an avid reader, um, he liked humor. He liked to dance with his wife. Um, he was not a social animal. He didn't care what other people thought. He knew some people thought he was stuffy. Um, and he said, sometimes that's the uh, price of uh, doing great work is that people may not appreciate you in real time, but he did things the way he thought it was right. He knew his passion and he showed it very well in his 22 years at uh, NPS. 
Thank you, Marty. Thanks for being here. Is there anybody else out there in tile land who wants to uh, say, why are you here? What Don, do you hope to get out of it? Don, all, this is uh, Xinfu Wu, or Sinker, calling from Raytheon Missiles and Defense now in Tucson, Arizona. Thank you for uh, inviting me to join this audit. I think what I want to get out of this course is um, an idea of um, almost like trying to get back into um, advanced studies. So, so being somewhat philosophical and then um, preparing myself for, for advanced studies. Over. Thank you, Sinker. Glad you're here. Congratulations on your new corporate name. Oh, thanks. Irene, I think we saw you out there. Yes, I'm out here and uh, also listening in, fascinated and, and actually very happy to be here. I've had the uh, advantage in some ways of having worked uh, with both you and with Dr. Mandelberg and also just, as you might imagine, in the line and, and how how he continues to influence people. So I'm kind of just riding on the back of this thing and trying to hold, I'm going to try and hold on as well as I can. And I'm really looking forward to what comes out of it. That's about it for me. Thank you, Irene. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Emily, are you still there? About Bill. Hey, yes, sir. Uh, I know a little bit about hamming. Uh, mainly, I was intrigued by your email. Um, I'm just I'm trying to mull over the class requirements, but really, what's driving my interest in this is just looking at Hamming's knowledge, his his logic, and just overall what his thought process is. So, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any. Save thoughts. Okay, you got one more chance to chime in at the end of the uh, session. Let's dive right back into the deep end of the pool. Uh, uh, so, Lauren, thanks for the comment about uh, the zoomfuscation of my screen before. Uh, how is it now? Is it uh, coming across a little better? Okay, thank you. So. Uh, all right, the wartime call to service. And then uh, it, was, it was always surprising to me that people were, were off put by hamming, you know, thought him stuffy or too big, you know, too full of himself or, or too opinionated or, or whatever, you know, you could come up with other words. And because uh, often the way they reacted to him sometimes told you more about the other person than it told you about hamming because yeah, I, I always had to wonder, uh, did, but did you listen to what he said? <laughs> so, oh, no, he's too, uh, he's too proud of himself. He's too full of himself. Well, here's, here he is. He gets his PhD from Princeton. And he didn't have to go into the middle of the desert. And he did. And then he said, what was my job? And he said, well, I, he, him describing his job to us was, well, I was the janitor of science. I did all the, the stupid little stuff that nobody else wanted to do because they had all these big mathematicians and physicists and giant 800 pound brain people. And I was just there, you know, tidying up and, and, and specifically he was, besides doing the, the little jobs people didn't want to do, but they needed a PhD for, they put him in charge of the calculator room, the computers. And uh, uh, the computers were actually uh, people, usually young ladies who were there with uh, 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 push the buttons and do uh, uh, a multiplication or possibly a division turn the crank and write the number down. And, and so uh, everybody knows what a flop is. 
floating point operations per section per second. Okay. They were seven seconds per flop on, on average. It would take seven seconds to do a multiplication or a division. Okay. So that's how they were simulating plugging in numbers to those equations, trying to get insight back on <coughs> uh, nuclear explosions, atomic fission. Uh, so on the slide, we have the uh, oxygen 18. Uh, uh, when somebody finds this in the video, uh, let's flag it so we can make that, that clip avail easily, readily available to people. But um, Dr. Hamming described to us how often when he was upset, he would, something bothered him, or he was worried about it, he would go walk in the hall. He'd just walk around and trying to think about it and what's going on here. And, and uh, so one day he's, he's walking the halls and something was really bothering him. And uh, they were, they were going to do the uh, uh, first atomic test the next day. And there was one part of all the math. And, and right, this is the guy who's checking all the numbers for all the math, for all the theory and the variation thereof. He, and, and one of the big physicists sees him and calls him in and says, what's it, Pamming, Pamming, what's the matter? What's it? So, well, you know, uh, we've done all this work on, on fission and all the computation. Yeah, yeah, by what? We don't really know what the absorptive cross-section of slow neutrons are for oxygen-18, the isotope, oxygen-16, the primary isotope of oxygen in, in the Earth's atmosphere, but oxygen-18, the non-trivial percentage of it, we really don't know that number. Okay, now uh, here's the translation of that bullet on the slide. I'm, I'm not making a joke of this. This is a real story. So we might detonate the atmosphere. <laughs> okay, so the, file that under conversation stopper of the week. Okay, we might detonate the atmosphere. Long pause. And he said a long pause when he said that to the guy. Uh, this was this and. This is finally came back to said, well, if you're wrong, you're wrong. Don't worry about it. If you're right, well, nobody will know. <laughs> so here we are, you know, brand new grad students going, oh, my God. They could have destroyed the world and life as we know it. So our section leader saved the day and uh, came in. Yeah, he asked all the hard questions, Marine Captain. So, so Dr. Hamming, Dr. Hamming, did you, did you tell your wife that time? She gave us the look again and said, no. But, but it was very good to wake up the next morning, next day. Okay, let's keep working on the right problems here. So the rest of this slide set just goes on and on and on and on and on, just because we can't do it today. But yes, these are fundamental things that he did with forward error correcting codes, and we'll study these, we'll look at these. Hamming distance and all that that implies. Other concepts which are named for him and other things which are not named for him that he had a role in. And uh, the list really does go on and on and on. And um, let me take this moment to apologize. We, I'm sure, have not given him full credit for all the things that, have, that he did. And I'm not sure anybody has, because there's so many. We're still trying to take a, shake a stick at it. So God bless you, Irene, and the uh, Calhoun Library, and keep going. 
uh, there are still things to learn here. There are a lot of things to learn here. And I think we're going to continue learning stuff as we go through his materials, his assets, just what he said, much less his impact too. There's a lot here. Irene, do you guys have any sense of, can you touch bottom on that topic? Uh, you mean about the uh, the number of things that uh, Hamming has influenced or the number of documents that we have been able to collect? Just the number of documents. Let's settle for that. That's quantitative. Right. Oh, I can give you that answer, but I'll have to take a minute to go and look. I mean, you know, okay. I would say uh, it's got to be a couple hundred off the top of my head. You think I'd know that. Give me a minute okay. and I'll put it in chat. So while you're looking okay. at that, let's turn to the yeah. biographer. Dr. Mandelberg, uh, do you think we we can tell everything that Hamming influenced? Well, um, I believe we can do about 85 to 90 percent. Um, I have seen every document that Irene has, I believe. I have seen every document uh, that Bell Labs has that nobody that no one has seen and 32 years. I've seen some stuff from Los Alamos, but only unclassified. And I've seen things that the family, his niece had. Altogether, I'd estimate page count about 25,000 pages, including Hamming's 10 books. Um, he's touted with 100 articles. I believe it's closer to 200. And um, I have some things that will be available very soon in this book. Thank you, Marty. So, um, and on the screen, we have a copy of at least one side of the Hamming Medal. There's a, uh, a short project for somebody who wants it in this class or a future class. What's the story of the Hamming Medal? What's it all about? And why did IEEE create a medal named after Hamming? And what are those mathematical symbols cast in bronze? Irene, back to you. Okay. I'm sorry. We will here. find I couldn't, out. Couldn't find, my mute button. couldn't find my mute button there for a minute. Um, no worries. So you're asking me why did they create that medal? No, no. How many? You were going to look up a number. Oh, yeah, yeah. I put it in. For another I, session? That's okay. No, I put it in chat. The number currently in the archive that is that are digitized and available for use are 157 right now with more to come. Uh, there's a link also included in the chat, which if you click on it, will just show you the whole thing in chronological order. So if you if you want to poke around and see what there is. Thank you, guys. And thanks for the uh, other chat messages, too. Go ahead. Uh, uh, this is Marty Mandelberg, a beer at the Trident Room, who, to whoever properly uh, uh, researches and figures out what are those symbols on the back of the Hamming, uh, IEEE Hamming Medal. I know, so I'm excluded from the contest. And one other person knows it, and he's the one who told it to me. Uh, but I'll leave it to the interested person to figure out why the back of the metal is that way. And I hope you'll share it with us at the library too, because <laughs> I'd love to be able to account for that yeah. once you're ready to Absolutely. let it be no longer. In and, um, <laughs> it's and in Irene and I take my for book, action. Irene. Uh, yeah, and we'll take for action. In addition to your book, Marty, uh, how do we document this stuff in a shareable way online for everybody? We'll keep going. Okay, so I've left us with the last slide. This was his favorite quote based on he used it almost every week. And it's once again a very mathematical quote, very probabilistic. It's from a mathematician uh, uh, translating from the French, luck favors the prepared mind. We'll see this theme repeatedly in this course. Okay, so let's let's 
blast ahead and skip over a bunch of stuff. There's always too much to cover. Uh, but I want to walk you through uh, one of the derivations in the next thing. And I mentioned how we uh, – is the screen sharing okay? You guys see in the screen? Okay, thanks. Uh, um, uh, he talks, uh, he's talking straight to you when you hear him in the video talking about this. That is a very carefully prepared talk when he's, when he, because he's, he's telling you his distilled knowledge of intentionally observing, trying to figure out how do you do good work? And watching people doing good work and sometimes not so good work and saying, what can we learn from that? Uh, that was part of his career goals to try to understand and disseminate that to others. So uh, uh, you've heard some of this today. Uh, I even changed the uh, abstract because I used to say he, he talked in the first person without apology. I'm not going to say that anymore. He did apologize. He does. He says it's breaking a taboo, but it's the only way he knew how to communicate successfully, effectively, what he learned in this long journey of his. So if it sounds like bragging, uh, well, maybe you want to listen to what he's actually saying. And if it still sounds like bragging, fine. Great. No. Uh, um, so skipping, skipping, skipping. Uh, no, this is, this is, uh, oops, sorry. Okay. So, uh, I think a, a hemming hallmark was even when the topic was really broad, he would ask questions like, how, how do we measure that? How, how do we check, verify the meaning of that statement. It sounds trivial. It sounds commonplace, but he would apply it in ways that were to fundamental questions, such as, oh, uh, knowledge is growing exponentially. Oh, well, you, how, how many times a month do you hear that? Oh, we're in the midst of information overload. This was back when they were talking about future shock and there's always different manifestations of this topic. This was also back when the internet was connecting everything, but the web was not yet available or just be barely becoming available and sharing the information and the knowledge. Hmm. Hmm. So he looked ahead. He was very good at being pithy. He said, you're 2020. Well, how do we have that? 2024 site. How much knowledge would there be? How do we cope with it? How do we grow? I can't say it better than him, but here's how we sort of understood what he was trying to say. He says, well, let's pick a statement about it. And a common statement at that point was knowledge was doubling every 17 years. Oh, that sounds nice. Does it mean anything? What does it imply? So he pointed out, well, there are some tangibles that led to that. You could look at certain things like over time, what were, how many books were there? How many libraries? How many people had gone to school? How many were scientists? And then uh, people in jobs. And then all the way to, well, here, this sounds like a rash statement. 90% of all the scientists who ever lived are alive today. And if Hamming were here, he would say, well, I was saying in 95, and you ought to be able to say it today if it's true. 90% of all the – so his point now was not are these right or wrong. His point was what evidence do we have? Can we measure that? Can we compare that? So let's do that. So he said try to get quantitative. Try to put numbers on things. It leads to insight. It leads to you testing some of these. So he said, okay, so let's pick those two assumptions. Knowledge doubles at some exponential rate. Let's pick a time constant of 17 years. 
and 90% of the science ever around or alive right now. Okay, so let's do some math. And John, I'm sure you're much more comfortable with this than uh, a few of us. Uh, I'll, I'll offer a public speaking technique. Is, uh, um, if you, you guys are pretty well behaved. You're very, you're very professional. You're, you, you're a great group. Everybody's trying to learn here. Every great once in a while, uh, I'm sure Dr. Mandelberg's experience is too. You got a pretty obstreperous audience, pretty rough crowd. I found that when you have an equation or two handy and you put those on the screen, it, it really tends to calm a room right down. <laughs> It'll settle down quite a bit. So let's just, so at the risk of settling you down too much, I'm going to put some equations on the board and let's see if we can do some, try to do some clear thinking. And believe you me, we, it looks really simple in the book. It looks really simple in the video, but uh, I don't know, were you around for this iteration, Lauren, when we really tried to touch bottom on this one, or maybe you were, Glenn? I don't remember us trying to crank through it. Yeah. We push these things around all sorts of ways. So you're you're looking about the 11th uh, version of this uh, slide right there, and some of the equations. And well, the first first slide says, okay, this is an exponential process. And then, uh, given that it is, then if we integrate from the beginning of time to 17 years ago, and we compare it to beginning of time to today, then if this if this expression describes the total amount of human knowledge and all its manifestations, then there's a factor of two to one. It's doubled every 17 years. And if that's truly an exponential process and that continues over time, no matter where you go, and on average, it should be true. So then he says, okay, and this is before we were all distracted all the time. He said, well, let's do some math. And he, uh, solved it out and said, what does that tell you about the exponential B and what's the value that gets you to a 17 year half-life or doubling life? And it turns out that that number equals negative 0 0.04077. Okay, hold that thought. Now, let's say if we double that period and if we use that doubling period of D, then um, uh, let's see if I can fix this. This is why we need to put the slides in uh, um, version control to fix some of these things. Nope, I misclicked. I have it in non-edit mode. But uh, uh, the equation become we flip it back and forth and uh, Yeah, so uh, he does describe this, 55 years. Well, what's the working life of a scientist? Well, human lifespan has changed over, over the decades, over the centuries. But if we say, well, you get through college, that's when you're really you know, maybe uh, starting to be a scientist. So we'll give you, if that's 25-ish or so, we'll give you 55 years. Maybe you're going to 70 or 80 or something like that. We'll be generous. He, he, he's being generous here. 55 years of scientists, you know. Um, now, for you young people tolerating us older people, your, your expected interval might be a lot shorter, and you know. But we'll, we'll go along with him. And, and so he plugs those in, and why it's sure enough, well, the numbers uh, match. If we plug in the, the numbers from the first equation of 17 year doubling, then we find actually, uh, you do the math, it turns out to 56 point. Oh, that's about 55 years. So his back of the envelope includes integrals and canceling out and kaboom. Here's not, here's what he did not say. QED, therefore it's true. What he did say was those two hypotheses were logically and mathematically consistent. Hmm. One leads to the other. Interesting. 
and maybe stronger evidence than just anecdotal that these principles, there's something actually going on there. Okay, and then he works through uh, some of the numbers here. You can actually see these written on the board and him talking about them going. So therefore, when you're the chief of staff of the Army or the Commandant of the Marine Corps or the chief of staff of the Bundeswehr or the chief of naval operations, uh, uh, how many years are you uh, away from that? There's going to be three, four, maybe five times as much knowledge as when you first started in the service? Is anybody not intimidated yet? Interesting. Interesting. So you got to be, you have to, you have to cope with this somehow. And now classic canning double back is, oh, but if all the knowledge is increasing, that means a lot of the stuff you've learned already or you're about to learn is going to go away. It won't matter anymore. That's, that's the flip side of the coin of it keeps growing. Well, but what's your working set? What's important? And so he gives a few examples of that. And so now let's push on that. So how do you cope? How do you, how do you stay relevant? How do you go? And this, we get part of the crux of why did he do this course? Why did he write this book? Why did he share it? Because we have to, you have to cope with it. You get, and, and people were only then starting to get a, 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 well, beyond an inkling, but a solid realization that knowledge was increasing exponentially. I mean, now I think even your moms understand that. God bless your mom and everybody else's mom. But here we are riding that curve in a big, big way. At least it feels like a big way compared to them. And, oh, uh, part of that temporal symmetry. Oh, maybe in the mid-90s, it felt that way, too, compared to the past 20 years. Maybe there's a recurring human drama here. The nature of, of modern life is you have to deal with this. And you have to know what you need to know. And you have to sort of forget or not try to be the expert in all the things that don't matter anymore because that's, you know, the cliche there is uh, people trying to fight the last war instead of the night, next war. That's, that's the military cliche. So he says, well, the first thing you can do is uh, uh, concentrate on fundamentals. So what's a fundamental? Well, uh, one metric is, uh, well, this, this thing never went away. <laughs> Everybody's still paying attention to it, so that's measurable. Oh, okay. Well, we better we better be able to balance an equation. We better be able to say are two numbers the same if they have the different units, or not. If it's lasted a long time, and it matters. And that, but then he gave us an, another measurable aspect of a fundamental. If you know this point, you can derive much of the field from it. And he gives you some good examples. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pushing on. And then uh, thank you. Who, who brought this up at the beginning of the talk? Science is about exploration. Engineering is about making it work. Uh, if you know what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it. If you don't know what you're doing, you should not be doing it. But in point of fact, it was even <clears throat> evident way back in the 90s, modern times, really. They're intertwined. That <clears throat> science that isn't grounded in some engineering is not maybe very practical science or maybe real. Okay, so uh, um, there's so much here and that it, the way he ties it into human processes is fascinating because you're all senior enough having lived in bureaucracies that you've not only observed this from multiple levels of the chain of command, but you've been in charge too. And there's other people looking at you and how do you keep from falling into patterns of broken behavior? Teases apart yet further from a human perspective. History is bunk. Well, 
how can it be true if nobody agrees? Yeah. And how can it be true if we can't record it properly? Comments, please. Oh. Anybody have a comment? I think that's absolutely right. I think history is but a snapshot from one perspective. It's not, it's, it's no more true. Um, I don't have a comparison, but it's, it's this idea. We, we tend to look at history and, and read history and think that was what happened. And then when you get two and three, four historians from different perspectives who conflict on who advanced where and who fired first, what you start to understand is that, again, this is one of those, it's a good situation of understanding that you have to, you have to take everything that you read and that you think you know with a grain of salt and recognize that it's not absolute. And, and if you start to think about things in, in non-absolute terms, then I think it really helps to inform you about all of the various possibilities and the richness of information that you might otherwise exclude because you absolutely think that one person's right and somebody else is wrong. Well, and essentially, you know, if you're talking about human history, human history is written by the victor. So you, you basically lose the vast majority of what came from the non-victor's desired point of view. And then in the, in the small, naval aviation has a good little one. First to the blackboard wins. Didn't matter what happened in the fight in the air. If you could draw your story out before the other guy could get back to the ready room, you won the fight because you just took history. An administrative corollary is whoever takes the meeting minutes is in charge because that's what escapes the room. I guess that means I'm the, I'm the leader in moves, huh? As I take those minutes. <laughs> You're writing its history, Glenn. Okay, and then uh, then he points out the contradictions of historians, the the great man theory, and uh, the future was pretty determined, but the excuse me, the past was pretty determined, but the future is not. It's wide open, and those two points are not compatible. So where are the trade-offs? Where are the push points? Uh, that's definitely worth worth doing. And then this is. Uh, Pretty funny because here's here's classic hamming trying to turn this into a well let's make it measurable let's make it a decision tree. It is a very funny way of expressing it in the video. You uh, you can ignore it. Um, I think he says uh, this was to all the students. Can you imagine somebody trying to explain uh, quantum theory to all the students in King Hall? Yet Hamming gets a laugh out of it. He goes, well, you know, we don't, we think it does this and things work at a distance, but it's faster than the speed of light and it contradicts this, the, the speed of light. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you don't understand. Well, I guess that means I couldn't explain it well and, and then punch like, but don't worry, you'll get used to it. Bizarrely, right after I watched that yesterday, I came across another article in the internet, somebody talking about that whole problem and that whole setup. And these dudes have decided, not decided, they, they went back and did the math and they actually went back to Einstein. And there's now a new theory coming out, which essentially takes away the mystery of the wave particle duality. Now they have to get more peer reviewed and everything else, but they went about it in a very hamming way, going back to fundamentals, looked at things and took a part of Einstein's equations for special relativity that most people said, oh, well, that, that, you can't ever have anything faster than light, so just ignore that part of the equation. And when they applied that part of the equation, it flipped, um, the way you look at uh, dimensions differently and the time dimension turned into the dimension that everything moves and the regular three dimensions we turn into turn into time and that everything that seems to happen now 
with these quantum waves are just the points on the axes of the time axis and that it looks like it's a spherical bubble. It, it, was, it was weird. It was not 10 minutes after I finished Hamming's uh, quantum discussion of that, that this thing just fell into my lap. Cheers. And uh, it is one of those topics, the more you, you can keep talking until everybody's head hurts in the room. Everybody's. And we also had a policy manifestation of that this year in the Navy, where I don't know if any of you noticed it. You probably did. Probably crossed your desk, Glenn. Uh, we will now require all uh, naval universities to cover the basic principles of quantum computing, recognizing that something's going to happen out there. But we can't say what it will be. So therefore, you're not required to do it, uh, but you are required to talk about it. I'm sure I'm misquoting it because it's these four principles in a policy. Uh, it's a required course, but we're not allowed to tell you what it means. Okay, and then utterly classic story. Listen to him at least three times on the drunken sailor story and the random walk. And if the sailor sees the pretty girl, suddenly it's not a random walk proportional to square root of n, but it's linear. And you have to have a goal. He doesn't care what your goal is. You have to have a goal or it's unlikely that you're ever going to do anything that isn't just sort of around your, where you started. He talks about the people who work very hard, but nothing really seems to happen much around them. And so uh, in the course notes, you can probably see him at the bottom. Yogi Berra's version of that was, if you have no idea where you're going, you always get there. Okay, so here we go. And then uh, in the classic Hamming pirouette, he finishes with uh, uh, science, engineering, and then ethics. To get there, he first tenderizes everybody extensively with Get over it. The computers have a lot more advantages to you. And don't forget, there was no web when he's going over this. There are a lot of electrical engineers and other engineers sitting in that room. Everybody's going, yeah, but I don't believe in AI, and I don't want this and that. And you see people flopping on the other side of that question, but he was like, this is the future. You, we, we have to cope with it. And we still have to cope with it. And then the, the, just when you think it couldn't get more all encompassing, he jumps to yet another level and he, and he talks about religion and all the religion how he, he doesn't want to go there. But if you're paying attention as you go through these topics, there are religious aspects to this as a minimum philosophical aspect and it'll settle with Socrates. One of the earliest of the utterly well-known philosophers um, the unexamined life is not worth living. And it's fascinating. Not only when you grapple with this, but when you go through the rest of this book, you're not, you're not going to find a whole lot of overt religion anywhere in there. But depending on how you examine your life and consider other people's lives, it's very hard to avoid that if you're paying attention. All right, so uh, uh, we can go a little longer on anybody who wants to keep talking. I gave you an intentional deep dive where I'm doing most of the talking this time just because I wanted to give you some of the first person aspect of my good fortune to observe Hammy, to learn from him. My good fortune to work with students like you in how over the years we've iterated on this course and try to share it with others. This is all about you. We're going to spend more time on the next ones about how can you use this? And we'll go from the itsy bitsy, well, a little project here or there. What's the topic you care about? Let's work on that all the way to 
I might say something different in my thesis work or even my dissertation because I want to have the best influence. I want to have the possible impact that the work deserves. Okay, so that's where we're going. That's what we've been talking about. The uh, resources in the course are at your disposal. We will keep building them. And we will keep sharing them as best we can with others. I'll shut up now. Any questions, please? John, this is Marty. Can I have 60 seconds? Please, please talk. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, from having worked with Hamming, and you alluded a little bit, he did not like, he criticized scientists, including the great Claude Shannon, for not writing. Hamming felt that uh, journals and papers and lectures were useful to develop your thoughts. But once you got it to where you understand it, nothing lasts like a book. And I want to use a quote of someone that I don't think uh, overlap with uh, with Hamming. It's Claude Shannon, and it's, I'm sorry, it's Carl Sagan in his book, Cosmos. He's uh, just as a short thing, if I could read it. A book is made from a tree. It is an assemblage of flat, flexible parts imprinted with dark, pigmented squiggles. One glance of it, <clears throat> at it, and you hear the voice of another person, perhaps someone dead for a thousand years. Across the millennia, the author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head, directly to you. Writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding together people, citizens of different distant epochs who never knew one another. Books break the shackles of time, proof that humans can work magic. Here's my recommendation to the students and other professors. What I found most useful in going through this three years of writing this book was every morning, every day, I would try to write 500 words. Even if 450 ended up on the cutting room floor, the very act of putting your thoughts down will be valuable to you because it's your thoughts. We're not taking Carl Sagan's or Richard Hamming's thoughts. It's your reaction, your extrapolation, your extension. Write it down in a notebook, something that's, or you know, electronic or paper, whatever you prefer. Don't throw it away. You'll need part of it when you finish your thesis or your next publication. End of message. Thank you, Marty. Okay, I'll say it. I think you just said, write down everything you heard and thought you thought about today. Yes, this means you. Okay, uh, who's next? Shall we declare victory for today? Thank you all very much. Sorry we went a little long. First one's always the biggest. Very glad you're here. Uh, if you haven't signed up in Python yet, please do so. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone. See you next week. Be safe.